The Temptations of Mary and the events leading up to them, according to Mary of Agreda, in her work The City of God. In the 25th chapter of the second volume, titled The Incarnation, Mary of Agreda relates how the Virgin Mary, returning from the house of Zacharias, where she had gone to visit her cousin Elizabeth, performed some wonderful works during the journey. These events are an immediate lead-up to the events of the temptations which she endures. I shall start reading from uh, part way through this chapter when Mary of Agreda describes how the Virgin Mary, on returning to home, uh, stops at a hostelry. In the course of the journey, the mistress of the world performed some wonderful works. Although always in secret, it happened that when they arrived at a place not far from Jerusalem, some people from another town came to the same hostelry. They brought with them a young woman seeking a cure for her sickness in a larger and more populous city. She was known to be very sick, but no one knew what was her sickness or the cause of it. This woman had lived a very virtuous life. On this account the enemy, who knew her character and her advanced virtues, began to direct his attacks especially against her, as he always does against the friends of God, since he considers them his own enemies. He caused her to commit some sins, and in order to force her from one abyss into another, he tempted her with despondent thoughts and disorderly grief at her fall. Having thus upset her judgment, this dragon found entrance into her body, and now he, with many other demons, had possession of her. I have already said in the first part that the infernal dragon, when he saw in heaven the woman clothed with the sun, conceived a great wrath against all virtuous women. Of her progeny are all those that follow Mary, as may be judged from that same chapter of the Apocalypse. On this account he exerted all his arrogance and tyranny in the possession of the body and soul of this afflicted woman. The heavenly princess saw her in the tavern and knew of her affliction, which was unknown to the others. Moved by her motherly pity, she begged her most holy son to give health of body and soul to the unfortunate woman. Perceiving that the divine will was inclined to mercy, she used her power as queen and commanded the demons instantly to leave this creature never to return. Moreover, she banished them to the infernal depths, their lawful and appropriate dwelling. This command of our great queen and lady was not given vocally, but mentally, in such a way as to be perceptible to the impure spirits. It was so powerful that Lucifer and his companions hastened to leave that body and hurl themselves into the infernal darkness. The fortunate woman was freed and seized with wonder at the unhoped-for delivery, and in her inmost heart she was drawn towards the most pure and holy lady. She looked upon her with an especial veneration and love, thereby deserving two other favours. One was that she was filled with the most sincere sorrow for her sins, the other that the evil effects or traces of the demoniacal possession under which she had suffered were effaced. She was aware that the mysterious stranger, whom she had so fortunately met on her way, was concerned in the heavenly blessing. She therefore spoke to her, and our queen answered with words that went straight to the heart. She exhorted her to perseverance, and also merited, for, merited it, it for her during the rest of her life. Her companions likewise recognized the miracle, but they attributed it to their promise of bringing her to the temple of Jerusalem, and of offering some gift for her. This promise they fulfilled, praising God, but remaining ignorant of the source of their good fortune. Vast and furious was the wrath of Lucifer when he found himself and his demons dispossessed and cast out from their abode by the mere word of this woman, Mary. Full of wrathful astonishment, he exclaimed, Who is this weak woman that commands us and oppresses us with so much power? What new surprise is this, and how can my pride stand it? 
We must hold a council and see how we can unite to destroy her. Since I will see more of their doings in the next chapter, I leave them to their wrathful designs. Our pilgrims, in the meanwhile, came to another tavern, the master of which was a man of bad habits and character, and as a beginning of his happiness, God ordained that he should receive most holy Mary and Joseph with a good will and marks of kindness. He showed them more courtesy and good services than he was accustomed to show to others. In order to return his hospitality with still greater kindness, the great queen, who knew the sad state of his interior, prayed for him, justifying his soul and causing him to change his life. Her prayers had also the effect of adding to his worldly possession, for on account of the small favour done to his heavenly guests, God increased them from that time on. Many more miracles the Mother of Grace wrought in this journey, for all her doings were divine, and all who were of proper disposition were sanctified by meeting her. They finished their journey at Nazareth, where the Princess of Heaven set her house in order and cleaned it with the assistance of her holy angels, for they vied with her in humility and were anxious to serve and honour her by taking part in these humble occupations. The Holy Joseph applied himself to his ordinary daily work, providing for the sustenance of the Queen, and his trusting heart was not deceived in her. She girded herself with new strength for the mysteries which she awaited, and she put forth her hands to valiant deeds, enjoying in her soul the undimmed vision of the treasure of her womb, and, connected with it, incomparable delights and blessings. Thus she continued to gain vast merits and made herself unspeakably pleasing to God. Chapter 26 The Demons Hold a Meeting in Hell in Order to Take Counsel Against Most Holy Mary At the instant of the incarnation of the Word, as I said in Chapter 11, Lucifer and all hell felt the power of the right arm of the Almighty, which hurled them to the deepest of the infernal caverns. There they remained overwhelmed for some days, until the Lord in his admirable providence allowed them to come forth from this captivity, the cause of which they did not know. The great dragon then arose and scoured the earth, spying everywhere for new developments to which he might attribute the rout which he and all his satellites had experienced. This search the proud prince of darkness would not trust entirely to his companions, but he himself issued forth in their company to course about upon the globe, seeking with a most cunning malice to find what he wanted. He spent in this search three months, and finally returned to hell just as ignorant of the true cause as when he had come forth. For the great mysteries of heaven were not intelligible to him at that time, because the darkness of his malice did not permit him either to rejoice in their wonderful effects, or to glorify and bless their author. This was reserved to us men, for whom redemption was inaugurated. The enemy of God was very much confused and aggrieved, without knowing how to account for it. In order to discuss the matter, he called together all the infernal hosts, without excusing or permitting a single one of the demons to be absent. In this con convention, from a place of advantage, he addressed the meeting in this manner. You well know, my subjects, with what great anxiety I, ever since God has cast us out from his dwelling and deprived us of our might, have sought to avenge myself and try to destroy the power of the Almighty. Although I cannot do anything to injure him, I have spared no time or exertion in extending my dominion over men whom he loves. By my own strength I have peopled my reign, and many nations and tribes obey and follow me. Day by day I draw toward myself innumerable souls, depriving them of the knowledge and possession of God in order that they may not enjoy the happiness which we have lost. I ensnare them to these eternal pains which we suffer, since they will follow my teachings and guidance, 
On them I will wreak the vengeance which I have conceived against their Creator. But all this appears of small consequence to me in the face of the sudden overthrow which we have experienced, for an attack so powerful and ruinous has not happened to us since we were hurled from heaven. I must acknowledge that as well your as my power has met a serious shock. This new and extraordinary defeat must have some new cause, and our weakness, I fear, is the beginning of our ruin. This matter will require renewed diligence, for my fury is unquenchable, and my vengeance remains insatiable. I have scoured the whole earth, observed all its inhabitants with great care, and yet I have found nothing notable. I have watched and persecuted all the virtuous and perfect women who are of the race of her whom we saw in heaven, and whom I expected to meet among them. But I find no sign of her having as yet been born, for I do not find one who possesses the marks of her who is to be the mother of the Messiah, a maiden whom I feared on account of her great virtues, and whom I persecuted in the temple, is already married and therefore she cannot be the one we look for, since Isaiah says she is to be a virgin. Nevertheless, I fear and detest this maiden, since such a virtuous woman might give birth to the mother of the Messiah, or to some great prophet. To this hour I have not been able to overcome her in anything, and of her life I understand less than that of others. She has always valiantly resisted me, as she eludes my memory, or remembering her, I cannot approach her. I have not yet been able to decide whether these difficulties in regard to her are miraculous, or arise from my forgetfulness, or whether they are simply the consequences of the contempt in which I hold such an insignificant maiden. But I will consider this matter, for recently we could not resist the power of her command, by which we were dispossessed of our right to dwell in those persons from whom she drove us. This certainly requires satisfaction, and she merits my wrath solely on account of what she has shown herself to be on these occasions. I resolve to persecute her and overcome her, and do you yourselves assist me in this enterprise with all your strength and malice and those who will distinguish themselves in this conquest shall receive great rewards at my hands. The whole infernal rabble, which had listened attentively to Lucifer, praised and approved his intentions, and they told him not to worry about this woman, for she would easily be overcome, and he should not be without his triumphs over her, since his power was so great and ruled all the world. Then they set about discussing the means of entrapping Most Holy Mary, supposing her to be a woman of distinguished and remarkable virtue and holiness, but not the mother of the Incarnate Word. For at that time, as I have said, the demons were ignorant of the hidden sacrament connected with her. Accordingly, Lucifer and his companions, in malice, immediately entered upon a mighty conflict with the Heavenly Princess, thus making it possible for her to crush the head of the infernal dragon many times. Yet, though this was a great battle, and one of the most remarkable conflicts of her life, she fought another one, later on, after the ascension of her Most Holy Son into heaven. Of this I will speak in the third part of this history. It was very remarkable, because Lucifer at that time already knew her as the Mother of God. St. John speaks of it in the twelfth chapter of the Apocalypse, as I will explain in its place. In dispensing the mysteries of the Incarnation, the providence of the Most High was most admirable, and so it is even yet in the government of the Catholic Church. There is no doubt that it is befitting the strong and sweet providence of God to hide many things from the demons, which are better unknown to them, as well because they are unworthy of knowing the sacred mysteries, for the reason given above in number 318, as also because the divine power becomes more manifest in keeping the demons in subjection, 